Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ben Kieser with Applied Flow Technology, and I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today in our webinar. It is exciting to have all of you here today, and this webinar is, of course, being recorded as usual. For those of you listening in live, you will receive the link to be able to watch the recording at your leisure sometime later this week. And if you're watching the recording of this uh, webinar, thank you for joining us in that fashion as well. So uh, here at my time at AFT, if I had $5 for every time somebody asked me a question about something relating to pump and system curves, I'd probably have a couple hundred dollars. And so uh, that would be kind of nice. <laughs> um, we're taking it back to the basics today, but you'll very quickly see some more advanced stuff. And we're gonna be focusing on pump and system interaction and dealing with pump and system curves. And so uh, we will start off at the very basic level of what is a system curve at ground level, just to establish a basis. And then we will start taking it forward and a pump and system curve is a really useful tool for being able to help yourself understand where you're operating in your system with relation to the best efficiency point of your pump. Uh, just showing the pump and system together is nice and it tells you where you're going to operate at, but that's only part of it. You also want to display the efficiency curve and understand where you're operating excuse me with relation to that and that provides a lot more value to you because the further away that you operate from your best efficiency point of the pump the more problems that you're going to start running into now there are often situations where the usefulness of a pump and system curve very quickly goes out the window and it's not very helpful anymore and in fact there are situations where there is not a unique system curve that can be created when you ask what's the system curve uh, for this particular system there are many and each of them can be equally as valid as the others and so what we often run into is situations where people thought that they had a solid understanding of pump and system curves and what they are, but what they don't tend to understand is the limitations where they are not very useful. And especially when it comes to trying to understand things like uh, static head and whatnot. And so uh, that's where uh, we're gonna be able to understand where those limitations are today. Um, I did see a comment that the uh, uh, the presentation is not able to be seen, but um, I'm not getting that from anyone else, and so that might be on uh, your end. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started here. Give me one moment. All right, so pump and system interaction. What are we talking about today? What's a system curve and what is it good for? Huh. Uh, friction versus static head dominated systems. We're gonna understand what that means. There's a very important uh, thing to understand with the shape of your curve because oftentimes people will put pumps in parallel to try and generate more flow through the system. And depending upon your system that you're dealing with, that may not help you very much at all. And so understanding the shape is critically important for that. We're going to talk about the difference between the effect on your system curve of a manual valve that you set to a certain position, you leave it there, versus a control valve. We'll talk about the affinity laws, looking at generating uh, parallel composite pump curves. Uh, when will parallel pumps give more flow and when they won't? So again, that comes back to what the shape of your curve looks like. Is it frictionally dominated or is it dominated by the 
static head, the elevation change that your pump has to overcome. We'll take a look at the effects of if you have uh, different pumps that you're operating in parallel, uh, composite series curves, complex curves. There's a lot of situations here where you've got complex situations where a pump and system curve may not be that beneficial. Uh, you've got uh, math, multiple branch points, different liquid level elevations, uh, system curves that change over time, uh, control features. Uh, there can uh, easily be multiple system curves for a single system. And then we'll take a look at problems creating system curves and we'll take a look at some examples. So throughout the uh, webinar, I'll be constantly switching between the slides and looking at some examples in Fathom. So uh, make sure that you're paying attention because I'll be uh, going quick and we'll see a lot of good information here. I have incidentally provided a PDF of my presentation for those of you who are listening in live. If you are listening into the recording currently, then you can feel free to email me at benkeiser at aft.com and I'll be happy to send you a copy of that presentation. So again, that's benkeiser at aft.com for those of you listening to the recorded version later. All right. Pumps and systems. Pumps need to be able to overcome two different things in order to generate flow. They have to be able to overcome the system frictional effects as well as static head. Now, static head is typically understood as the difference in elevation from the uh, liquid surface of the supply and discharge locations of your system. And that is obviously correct. However, it can also be the difference in pressure between supply and discharge locations. So if you have a situation where your tanks are pressurized above the liquid level, then you will need to take that into account for your static head calculation as well. So it's not just liquid surface elevations, it's also the difference in pressure if you happen to have closed tanks. So in dealing with the liquid surface elevation, it's very clear here that your uh, discharge minus your supply is your static head. And so this is a situation here where the pressure is the same in both tanks if they're open to the atmosphere. Here's what the system looks like if you had uh, closed tanks. So in that case, the liquid surface elevation is potentially the same, but the pressure is different in both tanks. So that's going to also help you establish what your static head is. So just to make that clear, your supply and discharge pressure differences are the same as liquid elevation differences. And so for the sake of simplicity in the rest of this webinar, <clears throat> whenever we discuss static head, we're going to be referring to just liquid elevation differences, but be aware that your pressure differences also have an impact. All right, what is a system curve and what is it good for? So the system curves that you can generate, they represent the head or the pressure that is needed in order to drive flow through the system at various flow rates. And so uh, without any control features, if you have a pump and system curve, they're going to operate where your curves intersect. And so the uh, graphical nature of the pump and system curve is a nice tool because it demonstrates your uh, behavior for the pump and system in a graphical, easy to understand manner. And again, what you're trying to understand is uh, where does your pump operate within the proximity to the best efficiency point of the pump? And so this can help you figure out uh, how various modifications to your pump or your system are going to impact operation. And then as your systems become more complex, system curves very quickly lose their usefulness over time. And often, 
it may not even be possible to determine a unique system curve in some cases. Let me show you a quick example. Um, at the end of the PowerPoint presentation, I provided a uh, links to my, uh, I wrote a, a four part blog series on pump and system curves. And so in uh, article 2A, let's say that you had a system like this where you have lots of complexity. <laughs> What's the system curve for that? Well, it's going to be very complicated because usually system curves are determined usually with reference to a pump. So these five pumps in parallel will have a system curve that's associated, but you can also generate a pump and system curve for each of these pumps as well. And that's just talking about 10 or you know six different system curves. The reality is that this system by itself probably has maybe a hundred different system curves depending on the flow path that you're looking at. And so in a system like this, where you have lots of flow splits and looping and lots of pumps in different areas, and then you have control features like control valves, uh, fixed pressure points, fixed flow points and things like that really a system curve isn't going to do you any good and so uh if you could even generate one so it's kind of one of those things where you know if you uh had a hatchet you could easily build a, a decent looking log cabin and uh you can uh put something together you know fairly nicely with that but now we have all sorts of fancy power tools, drills, electric saws, uh, nail guns, uh, things like that. Well, with those more sophisticated tools, you can build a really sophisticated mansion that has lots of detail in it. And so, you know, the system curve is kind of like the hatchet where you have a tool that can provide some good utility. But if you want to be able to uh do something more sophisticated then a hatchet is going to have a really hard time trying to build a mansion uh now people who want to be able to generate a uh pump and system curve for a really complex system like how i showed here that's like saying i want to take all those fancy power tools and build a log cabin like i did before with the hatchet I mean, you could maybe do it, but, uh, you know, at that point, it's just, you know, it's a waste of those uh, fancy tools. And so there are better ways in that situation on how you could understand your system, especially when you have flow analysis software. Okay, so what is a system curve? Here, we have a pump curve and a system curve plotted together, head on the y-axis, flow rate on the x-axis the operating flow rate is where the two curves intersect with each other and so when you draw a vertical line down from where they intersect that's your operating flow rate you've got your total dynamic head where your curves intersect so the system curve again that represents the required pump head the required head or pressure that's needed to drive a certain flow rate through the system and so where your system curve intersects with the pump curve that is called your total dynamic head the total dynamic head is made up of a couple of different components first off we have the static head so again that's typically your difference in liquid surface elevation between your supply and discharge points We also have the frictional head. And so, as you can see here, this curve is shifted upwards. That whole portion is the static head component. The rest of it right here, that is the variable portion of the system curve. That's your frictional component for the total dynamic head. 
Now, let's go ahead and take a look at a example with AFT Fathom. So here I have a system where uh, my I've just got a single pipeline coming from a supply reservoir to a discharge reservoir. And so if I right click and hold the mouse button down, we have a supply liquid surface elevation of about 25 feet. And then we have a discharge liquid surface elevation of 200 feet. And then we have some frictional losses through the filter. And this is established by a resistance curve, or you can do a K factor. We have a heat exchanger with some losses. We have a throttling valve that is just, it's a butterfly valve that is open at 100% and it's just staying open. We have a long pipeline, which is about a thousand feet long. And we have several fittings and losses that are lumped into that pipe. So we've got uh, various elbows. We have a couple of valves. We have an additional K factor that represents some additional losses that we may not know about. And we want to do two things. We want to first understand uh, our pumping system curve, and then we want to compare that to the frictional losses in the system. And this pump does have a pump curve associated with it. So when we run the model here, and we take a look at the output, I'm going to make my text size larger. You can see that we have a whole bunch of uh, results here. And so let's focus on the head losses. When we focus on the head losses here, we can see the head losses in each of the pipes. And then when we look at the junction results down below, we have the head losses through the junctions. Now look at this, the pump has a negative head. Well, the reason why is because when you're talking about the uh, case of a valve, let's say that you have a valve and flow is going from left to right, you have uh, P in, and then you have the pressure uh, coming out. <laughs> Handwriting is not very good. So the uh, positive delta P across the valve is going to be defined as your inlet pressure minus your outlet pressure, okay? Well, we know that for a valve, your uh, inlet pressure is going to be greater than your outlet pressure. So that's where this is defined as a positive delta P value. Well, when you apply this equation to a pump, your pressure is going to be greater at the outlet than at the inlet. That is obviously why we are using a pump to increase the pressure. So that's why when you look at the results here, you're going to see a negative head, lo or head loss for the pump. Now, let's take a look at the pump summary tab really quick here. So as you can see here, there is a pump summary tab and there's a pump uh, tab at the bottom. Both of these have to do with a pump. There's also the same thing for uh, valve at the top, valve at the bottom, heat exchanger at the top, heat exchanger at the bottom. The question is, how are those two fields different from each other? Why would we be showing the same results twice? Well, we're not. Here's the difference. The results that you see in the summary tabs, these are component specific results that only apply to their specific type of junction that they are. And then down here at the bottom, these results are generic common parameters that apply generally to all junction types. So if you're trying to determine what the CV is for a valve, a CV value doesn't mean anything for a pump or a heat exchanger. So you're going to look in the valve summary tab right here. There's the CV value. Just like a pump, 
you know, you've got a MPSH value for your pump. Well, MPSH doesn't mean anything for a valve or a heat exchanger. So you're going to look in the pump summary tab to find your MPSH values. So again, the top, these are component specific results. These are generic results that are common to all junction types. So if you didn't know that before, now you do. So when we look at the pump summary here and we look at the pump head, it's the essentially the same value. Um, it's just off by you know, significant uh, digits here. But you have negative at the bottom. That's because it's defined in terms of a uh, positive loss direction from inlet to outlet. Well, for a pump, it's reversed. Okay, so that's why you have the difference in sign. Okay, now let's take a look at our graph results window and let's generate a pump and system curve. Now, if you don't know how to generate a pump and system curve in Fathom, it's really easy. Just use the graph guide. This will walk you through the process of creating graphs. So let's do quick and simple. So if I do quick and simple and then I say, give me a pump and system curve, all it says that I have to do is just click generate. Wow, that was easy. But there's some things I want to do to modify this graph a little bit. I want to extend the flow rate range out to the right a little bit. I also want my curves to go all the way back to the y axis. And I want to show my efficiency curve on here as well. So I'm going to modify this a little bit. Here's how Fathom generates a system curve for a pump, okay? What it does is it takes your model into the background and over a series of flow rates, it actually changes your pump from a pump curve to a pseudo sizing model where it specifies a fixed flow rate. And when it specifies a fixed flow rate, it calculates what the required pump head needs to be in order to overcome your system resistance and elevation change. And then it ultimately plots that head and uh, flow together and that generates the system curve. So that is where your flow rate range comes into place here. So what I wanna do is I want to do a user specified flow rate range and I'm gonna go from 0.1 to 800. Why is it that I can't just do zero? Well, it's not going to be able to do a flow rate of zero because you probably get some divide by zero errors in the solver. So just do a very small value, 0 0.1, and that way you'll be able to graphically get your curves back to the y axis. Now, I'm also going to show my efficiency curve, and then here's the data points. For the curve. So if I'm going from 0.1 to 800 gallons per minute, well, that's essentially going to be 800 divided by 30. So Fathom is going to establish your system curve by running it at 27 gallon per minute increments over and over, increasing the flow. And that's what it's doing when it generates. So when I click on the generate button, watch what happens you see a little window where fathom is going through the system curve generation process so you can see <laughs> it goes very quickly uh let's go ahead and do um 200 data points that way it takes a little bit longer so here watch how that flow rate changes that's what fathom is doing is it is running the model over and over and over and over 200 times at various flow rate increments where it uses that fixed flow pump it calculates the dh and that's how it gives you your system curve so hopefully that is clear now let's take a look at where these curves intersect right here if i turn on my crosshair i can put my mouse right where the curves intersect and so it's at about 502 gallons per minute uh, or so. I mean, this is just, you know, I would have to do a lot more data points to get it exactly at 500. 
and the pump head, the total dynamic head, is about 243 feet. Okay, so if I add up the head losses in the system as well as the static head, that should give me 243 feet. So let's go ahead and try that. If I go to my output window here and I'm going to open up Excel, we'll throw Excel right here and see if it'll let me change the size. There we go. Okay, so let's go ahead and add up some losses here. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to copy this column and i'm going to call this pipes and this is the head loss for the pipes and then we'll take a look at the head loss for the junctions so it's be junctions and then i'm going to have my static head and that is equal to the the discharge liquid surface elevation 200 feet minus the uh, value of 24.3, whatever it is. There we go. Now, I'm going to take out the pump head here from the junctions because this is a negative value and I'm trying to get the head loss, okay? Uh, actually, uh, let's try it this way. If I just do a sum of everything, so we'll sum that column, and then we'll sum this column, and then we'll sum this column, that gives us zero. So everything balances out. Well, that's good. So what if we take out this head? Well, now we have 243.6 feet. That is the head rise 243.6 so everything checks out and that is how fathom develops your system curve and the operating points and when i show my efficiency curve you can see here that we're operating very closely to the bep we have our 70 percent of bep and 120 percent of bep for our preferred operating region and we can see how um, our curves go back to the y-axis. Lots of excellent data here. Now, if you want to know exactly what data points that Fathom is using, a couple easy ways to do that. You could click on this button right here, and this will copy the XY data for the curve, and then you can just paste it right in. So this gives you your flow rate increments. Another thing that you can do is you can click on the button next to it right here. This is the show data button. So when you show the data, you have this panel right here where you can expand each set. And that's where you can click on these different data point values and you can see what the head and flow is along the curves. And you can do that for the system curve. You can do that for the pump curve. The efficiency curve, etc. All right, so that is a very basic system for a pump and system curve. Now let's go ahead and jump back into the presentation here. All right, let's get these animations on there. Okay, so let's talk about frictional losses in the piping system. So you've got frictional losses through your piping, valves, fittings, uh, big pieces of equipment, etc. You also have frictional losses through control valves or things that help control the flow, like flow control valves or pressure control valves, orifice plates, throttling valves, etc. And so uh, it's useful to think in terms of head rather than pressure, and this is going to show you how your head loss and pressure loss are related to each other. So here we have your delta P equals rho G delta H. You can do some good old mathematical manipulation, and essentially what you have here is that your head is going to be equal to or proportional to your resistance times the square of the flow rate 
and that's how you get your nice quadratic system curve shape where as your flow rate increases your head loss is going to increase significantly so let's talk about purely frictionally dominated systems so a purely frictional dominated system is when uh, you're going to have a system curve go to zero so here let's say that you have two tanks and they have the same liquid service elevation uh, maybe this is a uh, very very large tank and maybe this is a smaller tank and their liquid levels are the same you're just trying to get flow from you know a massive body of water to a smaller body of water well in that case you're going to have no elevation change so therefore your system curve goes down to zero so there's no static head in that case this also could be representative of a closed loop system closed loop systems are purely frictional and they will always have no static head it's zero therefore any pump can produce flow since there's no elevation to overcome you could have a pump curve right here and you can still get flow through the system it's not going to be very much flow but you will be able to generate flow with even a small pump when you have no elevation changes and it's a zero static head now when you have elevation differences especially with uh supply and discharge your system curve is going to shift up and down as your liquid surface elevation changes okay and so when your liquid surface elevation uh, increases, uh, no flow is going to happen unless your pump is able to overcome the higher head. So let's take a system where you have an original pump and system curve based upon original supply and discharge liquid levels. So here, you have your original operating point, your original static head, and your original friction head. As you fill up your discharge reservoir, and you also maybe empty your supply reservoir, your static head and your liquid surface elevations are going to change. They're going to shift upwards. So here you have a new system curve with increased static head. So when you have increased static head, your pump has to make sure it can still overcome that increased value. So when you have increased static head, your flow decreases as your pump operates along its curve. Okay, it's not gonna operate off of its curve. So you have a new flow rate and you're going to have a new total dynamic head. So you have your increase in static head and your total dynamic head increases to this point right here. Notice how the frictional head decreases. Well, the reason why the frictional head decreases is because your flow rate is reduced when you're going from one point to another. So that's where your resistance drops. So this is what happens if you are changing your static head over time as you're filling up a discharge tank, perhaps. All right. A static head dominated system is where the primary job of your pump is to overcome very large elevation differences. Okay. So for static head dominated systems, you're going to see more of a flatter shape of a system curve, okay? There are still frictional losses, but those frictional losses are much smaller in comparison to the static head that the pump has to overcome. So understanding this type of behavior is critical for when you get to trying to add multiple pumps in parallel to try and generate more flow the cases where you can generate more flow 
with additional pumps in parallel really only happens when you have a static dominated system. So if I take a second curve right here for my pump and then I extend outwards the static head here, we can see that I do have a increase in flow rate by adding another pump in parallel. However, the flow does not just double. It's not just gonna be equal to two times the flow. It's gonna be less. So if you have a static dominated system with a flat curve like this, then you're gonna be able to get a decent amount more flow. But if I was to try and throw on a third pump into this system, well, Look at that, it does not generate much additional flow with a third pump. So the more and more pumps that you start throwing in there, they're not gonna be doing you any good. So keep this shape of a flat curve in mind because when you have a static dominated head or a static dominated system where you're trying to overcome elevation changes, that's gonna be the best situation where pumps in parallel will give you additional flow benefits. All right, now let's talk about the effect of a manual throttling valve. So if I go back to my Fathom model, let's see, right here, here is my valve, which I'm just modeling as a butterfly valve, and it's 100% open. And so this is the K factor, all right? So that's gonna be the smallest K factor when it's wide open. If I was to model a butterfly valve that is maybe 50% open, you can see how that impacts the K factor. You have a higher K factor, higher resistance. But the thing is, once I set that to this value, that K factor is not going to change unless I tell it to change. So that's what we mean by a throttling valve. You set the valve to a position and then you leave it there and it stays there during your operation. So here, initially our valve is open and we have our static head and our frictional head in our original operating point. What happens when we throttle the valve down? So we close it a third of the way. Well, what that does is it changes the shape of the curve and it steepens it. You have more frictional losses now with a throttled valve. So your static head did not change. Your pump is still gonna be operating along its curve, but your flow rate decreases. And so here, your system curve simply changes shape, it steepens. And so that's why you have more frictional losses that you have to overcome. And again, you always wanna try and compare this to your efficiency curve. So as you are moving along your pump curve, based upon how your system curve is changing, when the friction changes inside your system, you're going to be operating either closer to or farther away from the best efficiency point. So you wanna try and stay as close to the BEP as possible. The further away you get, more problems. So again, that's for a manual throttling valve. Now, let's talk about a control valve in a system, okay? A control valve also adds frictional losses to your system. Here's a system without a control valve. So basically, we're just flowing through a pipe and this is going to be the maximum flow that you can get. Why would we wanna put a control valve in there? Uh, well, here's our pump assistant curve for no control valve. You have your original flow rate, your original static head, and your original frictional head. Now, let's throw a control valve in there. So if my original operating flow rate right here was 500 gallons per minute, maybe in the winter time, I only need 350 gallons per minute. 
So here, if I put a, a flow control valve in there and I put the set point to 350 gallons per minute, what happens? Well, here's your flow with the control valve. So when I set that to 350 gallons per minute, that is less flow. But the thing is, when you're doing this, your curves are not going to intersect at your new operating point. So this is your new operating point right here with your control valves. The curves are not intersecting right here. Why? Well, we'll take a look at that in a sec. So for right now, the thing I want to point out is that if you have a control valve, your flow rate is set at the control valve and the difference between your pump curve and your system curve, this is going to be equivalent to the head loss across your control valve. Now, is that by design? No, it's not. If you have a system where, let's say that you have a few different flow paths like this, and you have a control valve through each one. Let's say that this one is 100 gallons per minute, this is 200 gallons per minute, and this is 300 gallons per minute. Well, based upon the flow rate through each path, the control valve pressure drops are going to be different. So will their CV values and their open percentages. So, uh, and also their head losses. So when you apply this and then you look at a pump and system curve, my question is, is the head loss going to always be the difference between your pump curve and your system curve? Well, not necessarily, okay? I just want to make that very clear. It happens to be the case with one control valve right there. But if you put multiple control valves in parallel and they all have different set points, then the difference between the curves may not be equal to the head loss because you know what's the head loss of control across the control valves when they're all different from each other. So I just want you to understand this is not by design. It just happens to be that way when you have only one control valve operating. And again, the uh, pump and system curves will not intersect at the operating point. <laughs> Maybe this would have helped to add this on. I forgot that this animation was right here. So there's my head loss across the control valve. So why do pump and system curves not intersect at the operating point? Well, let's talk about how control valves work in the software, okay? AFT Fathom keeps it nice and simple. We're not changing the open percentage of your control valve in the software because maybe you don't have the open percentage versus CV data for your control valve. Well, what we're doing is we are changing the pressure drop across the control valve until your set point is met. Once the set point is met, we then know what the pressure loss and the flow rate are across your control valve. Then your CV value can be calculated for your control valve. If you go to the optional tab and you enter a open percent versus CV curve for your control valve, based upon the CV value that is back calculated when your set point is met, because we know everything at the control valve, this is where we can take that CV, look at the open percent versus CV table on the optional tab, and that's where we can tell you, here's what the open percent is for your control valve. But the important thing right now, remember, is with a control valve, we are changing the pressure loss across your control valve until your set point is met. This is very important to understand and to consider because 
we consider control valves to be, well, control valves represent what's called a active resistance in a piping system. So a throttling valve, that's passive resistance. You set it to a open percentage and you leave it there and you can change your liquid levels all day long uh, and your, your valve is never going to change position. It's going to keep staying at 50% open or whatever it is. That's a passive resistance. A control valve is an active form of resistance. So whenever something changes in your system, your control valve is going to change its own pressure drop to meet your set point. So think about the liquid surface elevation changes. All right, as those liquid surface elevation changes, your static head changes, where your control valve is going to constantly compensate by changing its pressure drop in order to meet your set point. That's why we call control valve an active resistance. Why is this important? Well, this will prove it to you. So this is best demonstrated by using AFT Fathom with the extended time simulation module. So let me go ahead and jump into another Fathom model here. Just this just takes a second here to open up. All right. So here we have our system, and I am using the extended time simulation add-on module to do a transient study. And so here I'm running my simulation for five minutes, and my time step is every 15 seconds. So every 15 seconds, it's going to take a data point. The cool thing with the extended time simulation module is for your reservoir junctions, you can model finite tanks. So with a finite tank, you could specify your tank's actual geometry. And during the transient analysis, this liquid level is going to decrease over time. And then this liquid level for my discharge tank is going to increase over time. So I'm filling that guy up. Now, if you look carefully at this here, my the bottom tank elevation of that discharge is at 400 feet, and that's where the pipe is connected, and my initial liquid surface elevation is 400 feet. So the tank is empty, and my tank height is 550 feet. So it's a tank that's 150 feet uh, foot high tank. And this pump is going to operate on its curve. It's just going to keep pumping uh, water into the tank over time. And then here we have a control valve. Now, I modeled this as a pressure sustaining valve. I could have used a flow control valve, but for trying to do a pump and system curve, it wouldn't work. And uh, I'm not going to get into as uh, to why right now. But anyway, I'm doing a pressure sustaining valve. So during the simulation, as these liquid levels change, this control valve is going to constantly change its pressure drop to meet this set point over all time steps. <clears throat> so let's run it. So it's doing the transient simulation and the liquid levels are changing as that pump just keeps pumping and pumping and pumping. And what I wanna look at is the control valve results. Okay, so let's uh, minimize these sections and let's take a look at the valve transient tab. When you're using the XTS module, you will see a summary tab and then you'll see a transient tab. The transient tab, contains more of your transient data. So if I expand this, here's all my transient data. And as you can see, my pressure at the inlet of the control valve, this is staying flat. That's good because this is exactly what it is supposed to do. 
Well, how are the liquid levels changing? If I look at the reservoir transient tab and I plot my liquid surface elevation of the supply tank, you can see how that changes. And then here's how my liquid surface elevation for the discharge reservoir changes. If you subtract those two, that'll give you your change in static head over time. So back to the valve transient, look at this. This is how the pressure drop changes at every time step. So every time step when that liquid level changes, this control valve is constantly responding, changing its pressure drop and ultimately its CV value. So there's the change in CV value so that I keep getting the same pressure. Now the flow is not constant because I'm not doing a constant flow. But this is why we consider control valves to be active forms of resistance. So again, that control valve is constantly changing to keep maintaining the same pressure when something else in the system changes. And this is why we consider control valves to be active forms of resistance. So now let's apply this concept to a pump and system curve when you have a control valve in your system. There are different ways that you can generate a pump and system curve with control valves. So one option is to ignore the pressure loss across the control valve as your system curve generates. So remember, when Fathom is generating that system curve, it takes your model into the background and it sets your pump to a pseudo fixed flow option and it calculates the pump head over a series of flow rates. So as it's doing that and it's overcoming your system resistance, it's only considering your frictional losses and your static head, but it's going to ignore any pressure drops across the control valve. And that's probably a good idea because when you're trying to get a system curve, you care about what the system resistance is, not necessarily about what your control valve resistance is. So take out your control valve resistance and then neglecting that will give you a much clearer picture of what your actual system resistance is and how your pump would compare with it during that process. The other option is to just include your control valve pressure drop. So again, as Fathom is generating the system curve at each flow rate, you're gonna have that additional DP across the control valve and this option includes that DP and so it's skewing your system curve because it's adding additional resistance that's active. Which curve is correct? Well, they're, they're both right and they're both wrong. <laughs> so the important thing here is that this is a case where a unique system curve does not exist. So how would you do this? Well, if you have a control valve in your system, I'm showing right here my output window results and my graph results. And when you, check the box for this option right here. This is going to exclude the active resistance of your control valve. So as you can see here, this is what I was demonstrating initially where your curves are not intersecting at the operating point. So here, my let me uh, zoom into the slide. So here, my flow rate is 1,007 gallons per minute, and my DH is 354. Well, if I look at that value, that's uh, not where my pump is operating. So where we have our curves intersecting, this is well past 1,007 gallons per minute. Here's where 1,007 gallons per minute is. What I did on this graph here is, I put a data point for the pump curve. So this is 353.6 feet. And then at the same flow rate, I've got the system curve. And then when you take that difference, you've got 19.4 feet at about 1,007 gallons per minute. 
that is your uh, pressure drop across the control valve, 19.86 feet. So that's pretty dang close. So that is what happens if you are neglecting the pressure drop across your control valve when you generate your pump and system curve. They will not intersect at the operating point. And look at that, your uh, curve does a better job at representing the resistance of your system. So it's looking like a static dominated system. This is what happens when you include the pressure drop across your control valve. So if you were to uncheck this box and then regenerate your curve, in this case, your curves will intersect at the operating point, but look what that did to the shape of your curve. It made it essentially completely flat. And so that's because your resistance across the control valve at each of these flow rate data points that Fathom is using to generate your system curve, it's having to include the pressure drop across the control valve at each of those data points, and that's going to dramatically flatten out your curve, and that's not gonna give you as much of an accurate picture of your system resistance because you have an active component in there. So that's two different ways to generate a pump and system curve when you have a control valve in your system, and that is one of the things that starts leading to complexities of your control valve or uh, con complexities of your system curves. And if you didn't know this, you might be showing someone a curve that they don't understand. And now that you understand it, you can explain it to your operators and say, you know, hey, there's two different system curves here and this is how I'm showing you. So hopefully that's clear now. Uh, if it's not, read my blog article that I included a link to at the end of the presentation and it'll make it more clear. All right, these are the affinity laws. I'm not gonna spend much time on this. Uh, we've all seen this before where you can change the shape or you can change your pump curve uh, in different ways, either by varying the impeller trim itself or by changing the pump speed. So whenever you do that, it shifts your entire pump curve. I do want to mention that if you're doing a impeller trim or if you're doing a change in pump speed and it's and, and it's using the affinity loss for this, you're going to see this flow rate in head. The results in the output window would show you this head, or I'm sorry, this flow rate and this head. So here we've got, this is Q2 and H2. This is Q1 and H1. All right, so whether this is impeller trim or speed, the thing is your pump curve shifts down to a different level. And when you look at the uh, flow rate <coughs> and the results, do not take that flow rate and apply it to your original curve because it's not the original curve. The flow rate and head that you see in the output window, that's of your new curve that was adjusted from the affinity laws. And so uh, with speed, it makes sense when you look at it uh, directly. So here, if I go into my pump and I set the variable speed to 80%, and I go back to the pump model, this is what it's doing. We've got our original pump curve and then our modified curve. And so when you run the model, you're gonna see the pump speed in the output window at some speed that's you know 80 percent if that's what it was the flow and head that you would see that's none of your original pump curve that would be of your new pump curve through the affinity laws sometimes that ends up being a stumbling block all right pump efficiency effects uh pump efficiency does not change very much when you adjust the pump speed it you know, almost virtually stays the same. You can look at the relationships 
with the Finley laws to work out the math to determine that. I'm not going to do that today. Now, this is based upon, you know, when you have ISO efficiency lines that are added to your pump head curve, here we have our pump speed changes. And if your system curve follows uh, one of these ISO uh, constant efficiency lines, that's where your efficiency stays the same when you change pump speed. So if you have a frictionally dominated system, uh, which I don't think we've seen that yet, we'll see it here in a minute, a frictionally dominated system, you can see how your speed essentially uh, your efficiency stays the same when you change pump speeds. So when we go back a couple slides and we look at this relationship right here, this is for when your system curve is more parallel to the ISO efficiency lines that you can plot on your pump curve. That's what it's valid for. Now for a static head dominated system, again, this is where your pump is trying to overcome significant levels of elevation differences. So here, if this is your system curve, look at how your efficiency changes with changes in pump speed. So here is 100% speed, I'm at about 82% efficiency. When I drop down to 90%, I'm at maybe about 78, and then at 80% speed, I'm way down here at 60% efficiency. So if you are dealing with a static head dominated system, then the uh, relationship that shows that the efficiency stays the same when you change pump speed is not as valid in that case. So be aware of that, but don't worry, Fathom is already gonna be taken in, into account for you. So you don't have to do anything different to change fathom. So it does it just does it for you. Okay, so here's what I was talking about when you add pumps in parallel to try and generate more flow. When you add pumps in parallel, the flow rate adds to the right. So if you have a steep system, this is a uh, closed system perhaps because the static head is zero and you might have lots of frictional losses, valves, elbows, different things like that. Here's the key thing to take away from this, is when you add in another two or three pumps, look at your operating point. That is not changing very much uh, on a flow basis with additional pumps. So here, pumps in parallel are not necessarily going to help you very much when you have a frictionally dominated system. However, if you have a static dominated system where your pumps are having to overcome large differences in elevation, more pumps in parallel will help you get additional flow. But as you can see here, the amount of additional flow from one pump to two pumps is going to be more significant than when you add on a third pump. So when you add on your third pump, that delta in flow that you get is going to be smaller and smaller, and that drops off actually very, very quickly. So even in a static dominated system, simply adding more pumps, that's not gonna help you either. Uh, you might have to resize your system or something. Here's what the impact looks like if you have dissimilar pumps. So if you have uh, different pump curves, then Fathom will be able to account how they add together and you would have a uh, very odd looking composite shape for your pump and system curves. When your pumps are in series and they're the same size, your head simply adds. Now this is the point where I wanted to really focus on is multi-branch pump systems. So here we have a supply tank and then three different discharge locations where the liquid surface elevation is different for each one. 
this is an example straight out of the pump handbook. And so uh, my question is, what's the static head? Well, to help figure out what your static head should be, the question is, should you allow reverse flow in generating the curve? Is the flow split going to be the same at all flow rates? What's the static head? Well, <laughs> this is where there's multiple ways to skin the cat. <clears throat> so let me go ahead and open up another model here that illustrates this. Let's see, multi-branch system. Okay, so this is more well explained in my uh, blog article for Know Your Pump and System Curves, Part 2A. Okay, so if you read Part 2A, this will become a lot more clear. This, you know, again, what's the system curve for a system like this? Uh, there, there isn't just one. So out of the handbook right here, you can see that there are several system curves. There's a system curve for only tank A. There's a system curve only for going to tank B and C. And then there's different system curves based upon how the different flow paths are added together. There's also a system curve for the branch where the flow splits, which looks like a pump curve. So that's actually the system curve where your flow splits. So this adds a lot of complexity to try and determining what your system curve is. And so uh, the thing is, when you're dealing with a system like this, if I just go and do a pump and system curve uh, in Fathom, I'm gonna get some uh, static head value, 24.81. And if I was to take that to look at the differences in elevation well we've got 150 feet 250 and then down to 100 how in the world do i get 25 feet for my static head well that's where it depends upon how you're uh allowing uh flow into the system or not so Again, remember how Fathom generates the system curve. In this case, I used the XTS module again, where I set a transient to change the flow rate on the pump. So the pump is changing over time in that case. In the system on the right hand, or the left hand side, <clears throat> I have check valves right here where they are going to not allow reverse flow. So based upon the flow rate through the pump if these tanks are not initially empty if they have fluid in them there might be reverse flow through some of these tanks and then based upon which check valves close that's going to dictate a shape of the system curve and what the resulting static head will be for the system on the right hand side over here I told the I told all the check valves to stay open no matter what. So if they're staying open no matter what, there might be a possibility of reverse flow through each of these paths, and that can show us what a different system curve might look like. Now, without uh, just for the sake of time, I already went through doing the math on that, and I took the system curve that I calculated on the pump and I plotted them together in Excel. So as you can see here, there are two completely different system curves depending on if you allow reverse flow or not. So the blue curve, this is where your reverse flow is not allowed. So where the check valves would be allowed to close. Well, in that case, the static head is negative 50. And then you can see the weird shape how it changes compared to if you're allowing reverse flow that's where i get 24 feet of head now if you read the blog article you'll see why i got 25 feet ahead so understand 
that if you have a system of complexity, whether it's something that is as complicated as a system like this, or <clears throat> something that's still relatively simple, you're going to have multiple system curves that are possible. And again, which one is correct? Well, you have to decide, <laughs> which also means you have to convince your client of their understanding how previously maybe their understanding was uh, they just didn't understand this, which makes sense because before flow analysis software came along to help illustrate this clearly, it's difficult to see. But look at this, our flow rate operating point is still, uh, or this is our BEP, and this is where our pumps are operating. So that part is still the same on the system curve. So that part is perfectly valid. So it's only if you're trying to understand, okay, what's the system curve and why do I have these weird shapes? Well, your operating point is still fine and you wanna compare that to your best efficiency point. So that part, you're still good to go. But your static head, that's gonna be something that you'll have to understand on how to explain. All right. And so this is just a few other uh, examples here showing how your different uh, curves add together. All right. Your system curve also is typically referenced to the location of a pump. And so uh, you can generate system curves for other locations in the system. So if you don't have a pump, you can still generate a system curve. Uh, but the most meaningful is when you have a pump, that's where you're going to have the most meaningful system curve uh, that you can develop. And so uh, some systems are not going to have a unique system curve as we have seen. And so when you're trying to establish what is a system curve that represents the overall system resistance, the more complicated of a system that you have, that concept breaks down and becomes not meaningful very quickly. Here's just another case where if you have tanks that are filling over time, well, if they're changing quickly, your system curve is constantly going to be shifting. So we saw this before. Uh, we saw this before, and this is just restating the example, but in you know the sense of a uh, transient simulation. So this does not necessarily have to be over long periods of time. Now, pump and system degradation, that's also going to cause a shift in not only your system curve itself, so if you've got lots of frictional buildup inside your system, that shifts your system curve, but if your pump impeller is wearing out over time, your pump curve is also going to shift. And so this is something to be aware of where your system curve is changing dynamically all the time. And so something you have to be aware of. We've seen the effects with control valves and how that impacts our system, resist our system resistance. And again, your head loss across the control valve being the difference in the two curves, that's not by design. It just happens to be that way if you have one control valve. If you have multiple control valves, it's not so straightforward in that case. Now, when you start getting into generating pumps in parallel or in series, and you're generating composite curves, and you're trying to understand how is Fathom generating these curves, you can right click on the graph and choose show graph data generation details. And this will give you much more information as to how we're figuring out the flow split and how we're figuring out the operating point. And then we go through and we give you the values for what we calculate at each flow value through the pump. And so that will give you a much better picture of 
how we're generating those composite curves. If you have heat transfer going on, uh, your head curve is not going to uh, be as meaningful for a system curve because your system curve is based upon head, which has a dependence upon density. So if you're doing heat transfer, your density is changing, that's a case where your system curve is not going to be as meaningful for you. Or if you have multiple pumps in parallel and your piping is not symmetrical. So uh, it may not be possible to get a unique system curve in that case. The uh, part three blog article is where I illustrate this concept. So here's what I'm talking about when this says, if you have pumps in parallel and they are dissimilar, i.e. they're giving different operating points in the results and your operating point itself is not well defined, here's what we mean by this. We have a system where you have three pumps in parallel, and as you can see, each pump has a very different flow and slightly different pump heads, okay? So if you were to take this parallel system and you added up the flow rate, and then you decided to take a average of the pump heads, would that be your operating point that you should use? Well, you can generate the composite curve in Fathom for the three pumps, but when you look at this, is this going to exactly match your total flow rate and your average head? Uh, maybe it does if you have a situation where your values are very close to each other, but if your pump heads are more different than that, then maybe this operating point at your certain at your flow rate maybe that does not equal the average head so this is a situation where the concept of a operating point for a composite curve may not have as much meaning all right so those are some important things to uh keep in mind when you're dealing with pump and system curves and uh, they're very uh, important. And let's see, I want to illustrate something with uh, this system here with relation to a pump and system curve. So let's take a look at this. Uh, let me call this assigned flow only. All right, this will be the, the last thing that I show today. So I'm gonna look at the assigned flow only. I'm going to delete that system and I'm going to delete these two systems and we're just gonna focus on this one. So here, my pump has a pump curve in it and I have a assigned flow junction where initially the flow is at essentially zero gallons per minute well, that's because I'm doing a transient where I'm changing the flow at this boundary location over time. And so that's what the change in flow rate looks like. So when I run this model here, uh, just give this a second. Um, as this dy dynamically changes the uh, check valves, uh, are potentially closing. So the check valves are allowed to close at a given time step as the uh, flow through the pump changes. All right. Now, I'm not going to generate, or I'm not going to attempt to generate a pump and system curve for this particular pump right now. And the reason why is because we have a fixed flow rate right here. And as Fathom takes the model into the background to generate a system curve for this pump, you have a fixed flow rate on uh, the inlet of pipe 201, and then you essentially have a fixed flow rate on the outlet of the pipe as well. 
So if you have two fixed forwards, you can calculate a pressure drop to give you the flow. But what's the pressure at the inlet right here or the outlet? Well, that's where you run into the reference pressure issue. And I'm not going to get into the details of that, but if you go to the help menu and it pulls up our online help system here. And if you go to fundamental modeling concepts and you look at role of pressure, this gives you a very basic discussion of what's going on here with the fixed flow rates, but it can happen in several other situations. So be sure to read the detailed discussion and this will go into detail about what that reference pressure message is that's why i'm not going to attempt to generate the system curve but because i'm doing a transient we can see how the pump flow rate is changing so here if i quick graph the pump this flow rate is the same as the assigned flow because the assigned flow junction is setting the flow rate through the system so with this flow the pump is just going to operate on its curve and so here's what the pump head looks like so as you can see at the different flow rates over time the pump is simply operating on its curve okay so that's working just fine but here's the point that i want to illustrate is that you know this is a very simple system but if you have things like assigned flow junctions where you have a fixed flow rate or an assigned pressure junction where you're fixing the pressure, those things will also skew what a pump and system curve would look like. And this is the reason why. Uh, at a given flow rate, let's say you know 200 gallons per minute. If at a certain flow rate of 200 gallons per minute, this pump is going to be operating at a certain uh, flow and, and head. Well, the pressure is going to be changing at this assigned flow junction as well. So if we go down to the transient and we expand this for the supply, this is how the uh, Let's see, am I looking at the right junction? No, I'm not. Um, hang on. 201. <clears throat> I guess I was. So if I look at the uh, pressure, at every single flow rate, uh, this should not be saying uh, pump. That's, that's incorrect. Uh, this should be saying assigned flow. Um, we can see how the pressure changes. Let's see, maybe it might be easier. So here, look, look at the pressures at the assigned flow junction. <clears throat> As I go forward each time step, that pressure changes. So when you have a assigned flow or an assigned pressure junction in your system, and you're trying to generate a pump and system curve remember fathom is taking that pump into the background and it's setting it to a fixed flow rate okay and it's running over a series of flows well if this was an assigned flow rate or if this is an assigned pressure here i'll just do this So if I was to try and generate a pump and system curve for this pump at all flow rates for my pump and system curve here, as we're generating this system curve at every single flow rate, keep in mind that the supply pressure is staying exactly the same. That's going to impact the shape and values of your system curve and also your static head so this is a situation where your curves become uh less meaningful you know let's take this further let's say that you had a flow split with another pump right here leading to another reservoir way up there well 
when you're generating a pump and system curve for this particular pump, and it's changing the flow rate at that pump, this pump is still operating on its curve. And so if this pump is operating at 0.5 gallons per minute, this guy is gonna keep on trying to crank at 100% speed at wherever it's gonna try and operate on its curve. And again, what you're probably gonna have if these check valves were not here is reverse flow. So all these things lead to complexities where your pump and system curves uh, have less and less meaning. So uh, be aware of those types of situations. Okay, to close things off, uh, again, for those of you listening in live, my uh, presentation is provided. For those of you listening to the recording, again, uh, email me at my email address, which is uh, benkeezer at aft.com. And that way I'll send you the presentation. And you can click on each of these links and you can read the blog articles. And that'll provide more uh, insight and detail to each of the situations that we've touched on today. So thank you all very much for your time. I know that we went long, but uh, this is important and complicated stuff. So uh, take your time to try and understand it. And if you have any questions, give us an email or a call, contact me, and I'll be happy to clear anything else up on pump and system curves if you have further questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care and have a wonderful day.